Well, and one of the ways we can get them more comfortable is because it's a simulation and the patient is either a mannequin patient or an actor patient who's not gonna be harmed or hurt by what's done mm -hmm. or not done, is we could literally, and we do, come in in the middle of that situation, we literally press pause. We're like, pause, patient's not gonna get any better, not gonna get any worse. Let's just think this through. What are the signs and symptoms you're concerned about? What are the signs and symptoms you're concerned about? Yes. How are you thinking about moving forward? How are you thinking about moving forward? So they can hear each other's plans. They can calm down a little bit, talk it out. And then we literally rewind a minute or two, start it back up. So it's sort of like a live video game. Yes. And they can reorganize themselves. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited, we are in Boston, Massachusetts. We are gonna be talking about healthcare simulation. We are at the Center for Medical Simulation. We are sitting down with Dr. Jenny Rudolph. Hello. Great to meet you, Alan. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And it's great that Matthew, your brother, ended up introducing us. <laughs> and I'm very excited to talk to you. I just had an incredible experience here at your Center for Medical Simulation where I experienced one myself and it was very inspiring for me and we'll have some videos embedded that will show people what this is like. We're gonna be breaking this down. For those that don't know Jenny's background, she's the executive director at the Center for Medical Simulation where she creates learning-oriented cultures in healthcare. She is also on the faculty at Massachusetts General Hospital in the Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care, and Pain Medicine, as well as in the Department of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. And you can find the link in the bio to harvardmedsim.org, as well as Jenny's LinkedIn, her Twitter, and the Medical Simulation Twitter account as well. All right, so let's start things off with our one of our favorite ways to start things off, which is we love asking our guests. We find ourselves as stewards of Earth. What is your current take on the state of humanity? I'd say my biggest concern for us right now is certainty. Too many of us are certain we're right and are not curious enough about other people's perspectives. And I think that gets us in a hole where it's really hard for us to understand what other people care about and therefore much harder for us to bridge from our point of view to somebody else's. And so I think as my mom, Suzanne Hoper Rudolph wrote about, that can cause uh, people in different countries to get very uh, um, solid views of each other that are very hard to move. They can cause people within our own country to get very uh, rigid ways of viewing each other. It makes it very hard for us to come to uh, compromise, uh, invent new policies that might help uh, with global warming or with income inequality, et cetera. And I think if we can learn to be curious about each other's point of view, hold each other in high regard, uh, those kinds of things could be bridged better. And Jenny has this really cool uh, acronym, WTF, which instead of what the, she has is what the frame, what's the frame? And that's great because then it, it gets people to think behind the other person's perspective. What is their frame? What is their perspective? Why do they potentially think the way they do? And I like how you said certainty. When we see things as a probability curve, we see a lot of people saying, I'm 100% certain that this is the right way. And then they can't have discourse about, about things. And so if you think that, hey, maybe I can be humble, I can be curious, I can say I don't know everything, and that um, we can maybe tackle some of these challenging issues of wealth and quality, climate change, um, global cohesion on these complex exponential technologies that are occurring. Um, that was a wonderful answer. Jenny, let's jump into your journey. So you're born here in the Boston area, and then you find yourself getting into uh, in, excited about medicine at University of Chicago, then at Harvard, and then now here as the executive director, doing some professorship along the way, teach us about this journey and how you picked up your interests. Sure, so it really came from being, I think, a lifelong athlete. I played basketball in college, I played basketball in high school, and I rode crew on the US team. One day when I was watching the 34th video of myself rowing down the Charles River, something occurred to me, I was like, wow, only we could practice and watch videos and rehearse on things that really matter, like healthcare or any complex technology or, or industry. 
And so uh, at, not long after that, I was doing a PhD in organizational behavior, and I thought, wow, is there anywhere, any places where people are practicing? And of course, there are a lot in maritime uh, shipping, in aviation, in nuclear power, and in healthcare. So I thought, how can I get to play, basically, for a living? And I think simulating, practicing, trying, doing it over video is a form of play, which I also think is very generative for us adults who tend to take ourselves too seriously. So that was kind of how I got into it. Yeah, this is a cool story because you you know you're we you, when you're in Boston you see this Charles River and you see these the teams of of rowing they're you know in their long what do you call the boat shells yeah shells and they're in their long shells and there's what seven eight of them yeah so they vary there's, there's eights fours twos eight four singles. twos and you see like eight of them really like you know rowing and they're moving quite fast um, yeah and there, you were on the U S team which uh, the u.s crew for rowing which is really interesting and then when you're doing that you, you like you said this 34th replay of watching yourself and you're like let's apply this to um to real world um ways of of becoming better in you know healthcare simulation in aviation simulation is already happening and so we're now seeing this in engineering software we're seeing this in you know, manufacturing simulation of designing certain parts of uh, aviation all, all these all these different fields of aerospace engineering it's um in biotechnology it's now getting more and more popular you know the show's called simulation and it's becoming more and more popular for us to figure out what is the highest greatest fit um, for uh, in, in a case, and in your case, it was how do we um, how do we maximize the the experience of 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 the patient and the practitioners, the physicians, the nurses um, that are working uh, on the patient. And there's so much nuance and complexity that we'll get into. I'm really happy that um, that the story makes so much cool sense on you getting involved in this. And then, so now, tell us about this. Um, this trajectory for you, once you saw it, how did you envision implementing it? So, in my T PhD program, I got really interested in industrial safety. And uh, particularly, perhaps because of my athletics background, I was really interested in what were called high hazard industries, sometimes called high reliability industry, depending on your point of view. So high hazard industries are generally ones where Things are tightly coupled and somewhat complex. So you've got processes that have to go just perfectly for everything to line up and everybody to stay safe, for example, in nuclear power or chemical processing. And I realized that without mindfulness and awareness, it was really easy to make mistakes because vigilance is almost impossible to maintain. So I was interested in the systems part of that. You can't maintain vigilance. It's basically impossible. There's research on quote unquote normal accidents that they will happen sometimes regardless of all of our best planning because things line up in unexpected ways. But I was really interested in the human performance part of it. And so I started looking around for where could I study that? What could I do with that? And I started by learning about how do we prevent and learn from accident and error in these high hazard industries? During that period, um, uh, my partner was pregnant with our first baby and I thought I need something to study that's nearby and close here in Boston. And so that got me interested in the simulation, healthcare simulation world. And I stumbled upon the Center for Medical Simulation here uh, and thought this would be a great place to do my doctoral dissertation because uh, medical error, healthcare error is actually quite rare. And I'd have to watch a lot of healthcare provision to find a few small mistakes. But here at the Center for Medical Simulation and a lot of other simulation centers, we push people to work at the edge of their expertise. So it's common that they zig when they wish they had zagged almost every single day. And so I could study what was happening in that context. Yeah, the, I love, you know, you're using this like at, at the edge cases or or in the uh, these error cases the, the we follow a, a, a procedure a lot we follow like an algorithm for a certain um, procedure in, in nuclear or in um, or in uh, manufacturing or in even when we're doing a sport uh, we're following certain algorithms and 
um, especially when you're a physician, you're, you know, you're following algorithms. And, and so what happens when you get a curveball that's thrown at you, um, when you have an edge case, an error? How can you, um, we know how to, um, which, which line of, of trajectory do we transition to that has the highest rate of efficacy of you know, making sure that the patient is safe and healthy and, um, and the procedure goes as, as, as well as possible? And, um, and I, I really like envisioning it as, as, as a sport because, you know, that totally makes sense, the connection between uh, your sport profession as well as your um, medical simulation. Uh, and then, okay, so then the implementation of it. So then um, you like um, using, you, you told me as this, like, this goal, better outcomes for our patients and helping clinicians feel mastery. And there's, an, there's a massive exponential growth of this that's happening. You said over the last 15 years, it's just been hockey sticking up. You have people from around the world even today that yep. are you know, visiting. So yeah, so tell us about this goal and, and how it's happening here. So I think I'll talk about this, Alan, in terms of how do you create simulations and how do you educate people to be really good simulation educators. So let's imagine that I've got a resident who's in emergency medicine and he or she has a young kid who's come to the emergency department and they've been in an accident and they're in shock and they need more volume, whether it's blood volume or uh, more, just more fluid in their body to maintain their, their blood pressure. One of the ways that that can get done when you need to get a lot of fluid in all at once or if, there's, if you're having difficulty getting it in via normal IVs is you put in something called an intraosseous line. And that is something that you basically put in through the uh, skin into the bone itself. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a scary procedure for people to learn for the first time. And so what we think about is what are the different things you would have to be able to master to put in an I.O. line? And one is actually putting in the line itself, it, the procedure. But the second is, imagine an anxious mom or dad standing there seeing you with this giant thing that you're about to put into their kid's leg, and they start freaking out. So there's several things that you have to master as that resident. One is the procedure. One is managing the anxious parent. One may be managing your internal self. So when you made the analogy to sports, one of the connections is this process of mastery learning or deliberate practice where you practice, get feedback, try it again, try it again. So we break that process up into different pieces for people. So one might be practicing the procedure, mm -hmm. just getting your hands and feet in the right place and putting it in the right place in the patient. The other might be the difficult conversation with the parent. So mom, you know, bear with me here, uh, and how you would talk with the parent, or you would assign someone to talk with the parent. Yeah, yeah. this is, this is you're really hitting on it from a way you know, we try our best to help on the show uh, make it clear about the nuance and the complexity of our, of our world. And when you take a, a procedure and you start explaining that, hey, it's not just uh, you know, it's not just roses uh, that it's all going to just be completely smooth every single time. There's so many variables at play. So, so not only do we have to get good at building the mastery at the actual um, procedure itself, the physical um, um, uh, 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 eradication of an issue or the amelioration of the health, um, the augmentation of the health in, uh, in any way, um, but also we have to deal with a... Uh, uh, potentially a parent uh, that is concerned. We also have to deal with uh, uh, something, another variable that's happening in the procedure that like we had a, a hypotension issue uh, earlier that we'll, yeah. we'll get to. So if something like that happens, how does the team react to that? So there's all these cool ways that you're, that you're running simulations. And just for, for everyone to get an idea of, of you know, what this actually uh, looks like, uh, you can see this video that we're, you know, embedding right now that, you know, there are these, you have these, you have the actual uh, uh, simulation rooms where there's an actual patient 
and a, a, um, a practicing table with all the instruments. You know, you, you see the heart rate um, and you see the blood pressure levels. And then you also, see, there's, a, there's a room outside of that which is kind of like the control center mm -hmm. where you're viewing what's happening. You can hear the physicians and nurses describing what's uh, occurring in their procedures. You're videotaping that so yep. that they can then debrief on what happened in, so yeah, so teach us about this because that was so fascinating for us to learn. Sure, so one way to think about this is practice. Uh, if anybody who's watching this practice learned an instrument or uh, worked on their free throw shots in basketball or hit tennis shots, as we know, you have to hit thousands of tennis balls to be able to hit a good top spin in a game. The clinicians who come to our center practice hundreds of hours every year, thousands of hours every year in their discipline, but they rarely have the opportunity to practice, step back, observe, and think about their thinking. So we really break this down into three parts. We think about what are the clinical results or psychosocial results. So think about that example, did the kid get the volume? Did the kid get the blood into them they needed? Did the mom get uh, talked to in a compassionate way? So the result would be the mom would be calm, the kid would be stabilized uh, uh, hemodynamically. The actions that the clinicians take, that's the second thing we think about. What are they doing or not doing, saying or not saying? So we can help them learn different steps of conversations or different clinical procedures or whatever. The third piece, though, is what we really focus on. So there's clinical results, there's actions taken or not taken, but then there's the thinking or the frames of the clinicians when they're doing things. So most of us humans, to do an expert procedure, or whether it's play a musical instrument or take care of a patient, we have a whole complex routine of thoughts and feelings and expertise that we're blending all together to produce those actions. So what we do in simulation is you can practice the actions, but then you get to press pause and either go into a debriefing and take some time and reflect on your thinking by talking about it with other colleagues. Or you can literally press pause in the middle of the simulation and sort of like a video game, live, die, repeat. You're just gonna, the, it's not actually a real patient, it's a mannequin patient or an actor patient who's not gonna be harmed or hurt by anything mm -hmm. we're doing. Mm -hmm. So you can pause, Think about what you're doing, wind the situation back a few minutes, and try it again. So it's all about the deliberate practice of getting better at whatever you're doing. Yes, yes. Yeah, as, as you're explaining that too, I was, I was thinking about as these um, simulations become uh, so indistinguishable from reality that um, it'll also be powerful because then people um, could um, uh, really not uh, um, have that going on in their head that, oh, this is just a simulation, so I may not have to treat this um, as seriously as I should be. So there's almost a very strange dynamic that will occur when it becomes so, you know, indistinguishable. Um, but I may love... I, may yeah. I build on what yeah, you're saying there on, for a second? Yeah, please, yeah. yeah, so that will be wonderful, and that may happen. But part of the art of good healthcare simulation, or any simulation, is we try to create something called a fiction contract, which is this idea that I've made it real enough physiologically, emotionally, and experientially, and conceptually, such that like if the blood pressure drops and you give a medication that should raise the blood pressure, the blood pressure will come back up. So the world is functioning the way you expect, even if the mannequin is a plastic mannequin that looks sort of real, not that real. What we find is people are very able to buy in and participate with their heart and mind if we make it real enough, and importantly, we make it psychologically safe enough. So yeah. your professional um, skills are on display. Like let's say we were doing a simulation of an interview and then we paused it, we debriefed. To do that, you'd want to feel like, hey, you know, people care about me here. They're here to help me become a better interviewer. Yes. Or maybe I'm doing media training. They're here to help me be a better interviewee. Yes. It can't be a kind of gotcha environment. Totally. So we can get people to be, act as if it's real with a surprisingly low level of fidelity or realism. 
Yeah, yeah. The the tr the trust um, that it, that has to be built into the environment that um, people can feel uh, like you were like you you describe that it's so crucial for them to feel like they can um, voice how they feel because. It, it's almost as though we have to become more and more comfortable with the dynamically shifting uh, patient care environment um, to say how we think the next uh, part of the procedure should go. And if we feel comfortable voicing it then uh, in practice, then we will in the, um, in the actual um, environment. And so building that sort of a culture between physicians and nurses when all these different things are shifting with, with parents or family as well as the actual physical procedure and all of the um, variables that are being tweaked along the way, uh, let's, let's, give, let's give the actual example that, that, that we had. Um, okay, we were watching an appendectomy. So there was... Uh, just about a little over an hour ago, there was uh, a simulation occurring where the uh, physicians and nurses on the operating table were working on a patient, the simulated patient, with, um, uh, with, with the, the process was to remove the appendix. And um, there was, uh, this is very interesting, we, uh, you know, I, I called it a curveball, and I'll, I'll, we'll let you uh, explain, but the general idea is that you threw uh, uh, anaphylaxis at the a team um, and the um, the anaphylaxis uh, caused um, um, it caused a, a, a hype a, a hypotension it caused a rash it caused a bunch of things that then they had to uh, dynamically adjust to so this was very fascinating for me watching it and seeing uh, a simulated environment of it because now they know what to do when this edge case happens in the real um, world and they can be prepared to um, to, to save um, the patient. And there was even the, ep the epinephrine drip that was occurring and how much of it you needed to give in order to kick the, you know, the body into action to fight the anaphylaxis. Uh, so yes, please explain this. It was so cool watching it. And then in the control room, there was, you know, there were people, you know, we were listening to them, watching them and, and it was so, yeah. so interesting. Yeah. And, um, well, let me, uh, I'll do my best to explain it with the caveat that I'm an organizational behavior scholar and not a clinician. So. I'm going to explain it somewhat conceptually, but with a few clinical examples. So what we would like to do in healthcare simulation is prepare people for things that they are going to face. So if, they, if that was your mom on the table or your dad on the table, you would like them to be very comfortable with anaphylaxis happening in the middle of an operation that one of your loved ones was having and be able to quickly know what were the medications they need to give and so on. We try to help people in our simulation center, there's lots of different kinds of simulations, but here we tend to help people work at the edge of their expertise. We have advanced practitioners who are already capable of managing fairly complex uh, challenges. So in this case, an appendectomy is a pretty bread and butter surger surgery, even a, a, a minimally invasive one, which was what was what's happening. And anaphylaxis is pretty bread and butter problem for many people in the textbook. Mm -hmm. So it's possible for you to go through 10 years of practice and you know all about the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, but you have never actually treated it yourself. Wow. Yeah. You And the other thing is the textbook presentation of anaphylaxis, which is an allergic reaction, could be hypotension, which is a drop in blood pressure, a rash, wheezing, a variety of other things. But what my clinical colleagues in this course and others have told me is, Anaphylaxis doesn't always present in the textbook manner. And so what we're trying to pr prepare people for is their own autonomic nervous system reaction, their own stress, which can kind of shut down how their brain actually thinks, mm -hmm. just like any other person. Mm -hmm. So you've got to calm yourself down, rethink what's going on, assess the signs and symptoms, and figure out how to manage the patient. Sometimes with additional complexities in the presentation of the patient themselves. So it might be a bread and butter anaphylaxis, it might be a bread and butter um, appendectomy, but maybe there's something complex about the patient that makes it extra difficult. And so we're looking for people to be able to 
apply the knowledge they have in a situation that's new for them. Yeah, yeah, there's a couple things there. One of the things was the um, physicians and nurses, we typically don't think uh, need to be uh, good practitioners of meditation or mindfulness, <laughs> like one's ability to, to see a, you know, a stressful situation and not you know, necessarily panic but maybe you know, take a deep breath, realize, okay, what do we need to do to best handle this right now? And then take it from a very you know, logical procedural uh, perspective. And then also, the, I love how you keep describing this state of, of, of flow. It's, it's almost as though, you, yeah, you're challenging people right at their uh, expertise level. Um, it's not too easy, but it's not, right. yeah, too hard. And then they're, they're right in that state of their um, uh, optimal uh, cognitive challenge. And then by doing that, that's how they keep becoming a master in what they're, what, what they're working on. May I build yes, on that build for a second? Yes. So one of the things that's important is uh, simulation is expensive. It's expensive in time. It's expensive in space. It's expensive in equipment. So anybody can study what are the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, what are the first line treatments. I could, you could study that and I could give you a test of that tomorrow and you could probably answer a lot of questions correctly. What we're trying to do is create this context where people, where it's valuable to work at the edge of your expertise, or sorry, to, to take the value of all this expensive input and help people at the edge of their expertise. If we're just about the knowledge, they don't need simulation. If we're just about the experience, which they get every single day, they don't need simulation. It's the unique combination of practice plus debriefing plus reflection that helps you get in that sort of deliberate practice improvement loop. Yeah, that's very, very well put. And there's actually, um, you know, like Achille Interactive, one of the really great um, progresses that we've made in digital medicine kind of takes people to their optimal level of, 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 of uh, cognitive challenge with, um, with increasing um, uh, um, certain areas of, of, their, of their cognitive processing, maybe uh, working memory um, or their um, just uh, um, um, attention, all these uh, focus, right? Yeah. So, so it's, it's as though you've created a similar, you know, closed loop feedback system with people being at their optimal level of cognitive challenge in an experiential environment versus a textbook environment like you're indicating earlier, which just has, um, you know, we're seeing today with the advent of like spatial computing and the 3D virtual reality, augmented reality spaces. It's just when you envision an actual biological system in the 3D space and you can tweak it, it's much greater level of, 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 um, of remembering uh, and, uh, and under learning than it is on a 2D page. Um, so you have the experiential environment, then you go and do the debriefing side of things, which then you're having discourse amongst your peers about what was what you could what you learned, what you could do better. And then um, you go into another one. It's just this is a very, very beautiful um, process that you've that you built here. And okay, so then it, it's also interesting that um, you have this process. I want to talk about the the actual um, debriefing and uh, DASH, the assessment. Please teach us about that. Sure. Um, so we were approached a number of years ago by a colleague who was involved with the American Heart Association, Adam Chang, who was really interested in how do we get novice educators to be better at the very, very important task of helping people be better in managing cardiac arrest. And he had some different ideas about how to do that. And he came to me and my colleague, Robert Simon, and he said, I'd like to be able to assess the quality of the debriefing after they practice doing a code resuscitation. What is the impact of the debriefing on the learning? Can you give me, can, what's your assessment tool? And we said, um, we don't have one. But we thought, hmm, challenge. So Robert Simon is a psychometrician, I'm a, organizational behavior psychologist with an interest in conversation and cognition. And we got busy with our simulation colleague, uh, Dan Raymer, and working with a variety of colleagues all over the world, we created an instrument to assess the quality of debriefing. So that doesn't sound all that interesting, but what's really cool about it is it gives a common language, a common set of standards, a common parlance, that we can all use then 
to create a community of people who knows how to have this technical conversation, better, better, better. So the Dash has been translated into about six different languages. It's about to come out in Mandarin. It's a, an nice. Arabic translation is wow. underway. And what's neat about that is simulation programs in Riyadh or in Beijing or in Santander, Spain, get together, work on giving each other feedback on their debriefing. Again, who cares? The reason I care and the reason I think it's really important is debriefing is a stylized way to practice having difficult conversations. Yes. All of us humans hate the awkwardness of critiquing another person. We would just rather do, you know, have a root canal practically instead of that. But what the dash or debriefing, getting better at debriefing helps you do is learn how you can be curious and assume the best of the other person, which solves this horrible dilemma of having to basically cover over my feelings and lie to you about the critique and just hope that you're gonna guess why you did it wrong. So what we focus on is I can be straight with you about the critique because you're intelligent, capable, trying to be do your best and want to improve. I'm thinking that about you, which reduces my anxiety and social awkwardness and lets me tell you the truth in a kindly way. Yes. And so the this dash so helps build communities that can do that better. You, uh, you know, this this behavior science side of things, um, the perspective that you take there about building out the environments that make people comfortable with having a growth mindset and are comfortable with critique, feedback, integration, and then further practice is uh, being translated into Mandarin and. Arabic that's huge, it's billions of people, that's awesome. And uh, I love the, you know, the debriefing side is such a critical, um, you know, you guys will have a, a video here embedded as well where you can see the, the sitting around the table, having discussion, watching the video replay of what happened in the medical simulation with the patient and with everyone moving and, you know, being able to pause it. Um, being able to rewind it, uh, fast forward it, jump to the different highlighted annotation points was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, that part was very interesting as well. Like when the actual allergic reaction happened, you can kind of like find that area and go to it. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very cool. And then you can rewatch how people, yeah, behaved at that moment. So what we've been talking about this individual skill development and, and cognition improvement and self-management improvement, you could think about that as the core of an onion of performance improvement, but I'd like to just mention a couple other ways that that's spreading out in the simulation world, especially related to some of the other de technological developments you mentioned. Yeah. So for example, with 3D printing, our colleagues at the Boston Children's Hospital, Peter Weinstock and others, have worked with their surgical colleagues to create a, con a process whereby if there's a child coming in for neurosurgery, they use the CT scan of that child's brain, produce a 3D model of that child's brain, and then the neurosurgeons can practice what's the route to get into, for example, a tumor before the child is even on the operating table, wow. greatly reducing the amount of time that the kid needs to be under anesthesia and in reducing some of the uncertainty of a very complex procedure. So that wow. is happening around the world. We need to do that interview too. Yes. Let's well, make that one happen too. That would be a fascinating yeah. one. Whoa, so we can actually, yeah, uh, we can model the actual patient's um, biological systems and then go and practice on their exact uh, uh, biological systems uh, like tumor or whatever the ailment is and then practice on on uh, removing that and and get mastery on it and then actually do it on the patient um, holy cow that's great yeah yeah so and then another application that's happening again using kind of simulation to look at the systems of care is a uh, colleague in Australia named Victoria Brazel and team at the Gold Coast University Hospital have been using simulation to map out the patient journey, but also build interprofessional knowledge and trust. So let me tell you what all those terms mean. So imagine that you want to get the patient from who's having a 
some kind of a heart attack, a STEMI, from the door of the emergency department to the cath lab for definitive treatment. They have to come from the ambulance and the pre-hospital providers through the emergency department, transported through the hospital up to the cath lab. Nobody really understands what each other's roles are there. There's sometimes uh, misunderstandings, even conflict between this. And we can set up a situation where people can wear GoPros and see each other's part of the process. And Victoria oh, wow. and team debrief 40, 50 people all together who can see that entire process. And so they learn about each other's roles and build trust among each other. So it's yeah. very easy to focus on the technology, but what simulation really is an excuse to do is understand each other's thinking better. Mm -hmm. So going back to the very beginning of the interview, what I'm passionate about is how do we build, how do we come to each other from sort of a stance of curiosity and respect? When we do these interprofessional simulations, people get more curiosity and more respect about each other's roles. Yeah, yeah. Similarly, I just uh, want to quickly oh, yeah, please, build Scott, on that yeah, one please, too. Please. It was so cool. All the way to um, the actual um, EMTs that are sitting in the ambulance yeah. uh, and having that GoPro so that you know the physicians and nurses and staff at hospital can see what they're experiencing with the patient um, while they're being transported. All the way to, like you said, just all of the complexity that actually occurs um, at the hospital. Um, being able to get behind with a curious uh, curiosity behind the eyes of every single one of those um, people along the way you're building that trust it's it is such an interdisciplinary um, field and uh, to, to be able to, to take care of the patient oh yeah give us more of these examples these okay so cool. well there's a, another one that I think is really interesting and important uh, which is testing out whether architectural designs actually work for patient safety and patient care so um, colleagues at the Mater Health Services in Brisbane, Australia, uh, that team at Boston Children's that I mentioned earlier, the team at Texas Children's, team at uh, all Johns Hopkins All Children's in Florida. All of them have different ways of bringing simulation to a building, basically, bring a patient, bring the people. So for, imagine that you're building a pediatric intensive care unit, or let's say a regular intensive care unit, you build a room that was, has a bed and a sink and all these different things, and it looks great. But what you hadn't thought about is if that kid all of a sudden crashes and needs to be on something called ECMO, or you need to bring a defibrillator in there, or you need to bring ECMO in there, and the defibrillator was already in there, and the 10 people that go with all that equipment, and all the plugs, and all the cords, and all the noise, and all, uh, Whoa. All of a sudden, all those things don't actually even fit in that room. Yeah. And you can't take care of the child. So simulation is being used to help plan, to do mid-course testing on architectural designs, and then to test after the design is done. So Interesting. huge cost savings, but also important safety advances. Yeah, so architecturally speaking, can the room where the patient's being operated on fit um, the uh, anomaly case equipment that needs to be brought into the room. Um, how noisy will it be? Can it be plugged in? Uh, all of this, yeah, all these, how many more staff members are going to be in the room to, to do that part of it? Uh, do they, how will they know the patient's uh, data? Um, you had this, you know, we'll have that little, this image embedded here where you actually have a whiteboard in the, um, in the operating room with the, um, the, the 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 data on the patient their you know their date of birth their their rec, like their uh, if they have any allergies if they have the um, their actual health record number yeah. itself um, but Alan yes. let me just I hasten to say I think a lot of my colleagues would really love it if we could go back to having whiteboards everywhere many of my colleagues are now working with an electronic medical record yes. or an integrated electronic medical record which is supposed to make life easier. Totally. But if you imagine that now you have all these doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, other allied health who are supposed to be looking at the patient and each other are now also on top of that basically having to do data entry. The data entry on top, and yes, so yes. And the so the electronic medical record, it adds a level of complexity that we're also trying to understand 
using simulation because it completely changes the relationships in the room, not only with That's the patient, right. Right. but with each other. Yeah, when we had Dr. Robert Lustig on the show, he made it very clear that he um, and a lot of the other physicians around the world have um, found it to be uh, quite difficult to, um, you know, you're the doctor and I'm the patient and you're spending, you know, a part of the time looking at me and empathizing with me and then part of the time looking at a device and entering data into a device and then that whole process is, it takes you longer. It, it's a, and it, it's also very important that that electronic medical or health record can then also be read by the other, uh, that the data can very easily move around, that I can retain some ownership of the data. There's all these, um, can that data then be used for med further medical research? Do I have control of that? There's so many of these questions and it, it makes a lot of sense to, um, to find the most frictionless process of being able to potentially capture what the physicians and nurses are saying by voice and then find the key phrases, uh, parse for the key phrases, enter that in oh, um, to the great. electronic medical record. That, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> Hopefully um, the, the algorithms that we're working on will be able to get us to that point. Um, there's, I mean, there's so many, so much else that, that we can talk about with the um, examples. I think this is an interesting one since this was, um, this was just happening. Um, we had, um, we had one of the, um, mid midwife free, um, nurses, um, visiting, uh, for physicians, mm -hmm. um, visiting from Belgium. Yep. So we had, um, and this was just was again just happening a little over an hour ago you know people from around the world usually have about four or so like let's say anesthesiologists that come in and that they're training they're from mass gen uh, massachusetts general hospital um and they're and they're training uh on on how to become a better anesthesiologist with these simulations but then you can also have people from around the world like from belgium coming to visit and so um usually what the midwife's doing is working with the mother that's about to uh, birth a child. And uh, there can be complications that occur, like you were explaining um, the, the shoulder could get, you know, stuck mm -hmm. in the canal and then there, and then what, so how do you, so then the, these are the things is how do you prepare um, the midwife to be able to handle a situation like that through simulation? Um, there could be some nerve damage that occurs. How do you talk to the, uh, the, the family? after that. So this is very beautiful. You were starting to teach me about this. And then um, to maybe walk us through some more of these, you know, you have people visiting from around the world and they've, they're in different fields and you have different simulations for them. And then they take it back and teach their part of the world about yeah. it. Yeah. So um, just to set this context here and then maybe pick an example that would illustrate it. So we have simulation fellows that join us for three months to 12 months who come from uh, whether it's uh, Germany or Spain or uh, Saudi Arabia or Belgium or wherever. And they are working on improving their simulation programs, whether they are skill-based or system-based or these different kinds of applications that we've discussed. A lot of what we specialize in is interprofessional communication. So how do people from different professions, which often amounts to slightly different cultures, because how professions are trained can be quite different in what your expectations are and your assumptions are, work together. So let's take the labor and delivery example that you gave. So uh, one of the things that we sometimes practice here is a mother who comes in, let's say she's had a motor vehicle accident or some other kind of situation or condition where she's deteriorating. Maybe she's heading toward a heart attack. Maybe she has some kind of a um, cardiac arrhythmia. At the same time, the baby maybe is having some fetal distress. So the problem is we've got to take care of the mom and we've got to take care of the baby. And the people who are focused on stabilizing the mom, often the anesthesiologist, and the people who are focused on caring for the baby, often the OBGYNs or the midwives or the nurses, have slightly competing objectives. Um, there are certain things that need to be done for the baby. There are certain things that need to be done for the mom. Mm. And they have to quickly negotiate that in maybe minutes or 90 seconds. Wow. They have to clarify what each other's goals are. And if they haven't been in that situation, quickly grasp that and find a way to make a decision 
For example, sometimes it's going to be in the interest of both mom and baby to do an emergency cesarean section and get the baby out. Wow. But to do that requires certain preparations and certain kinds of things for the mom. Sometimes it might be better to do something for the mom first and wait before we deliver the baby. Imagine just trying to figure that all out as the blood pressure is going down and the heart rate is going up and fetal monitors looking non-reassuring. These are things that we try to help people practice here. And so returning to some of the themes we've discussed, that involves self-management. Yes. How do I calm myself down? So my colleague, Rebecca Meinhardt, who's an anesthesiologist and an OB anesthesiologist, has been doing a study in one of our courses on how do the clinicians perceive a crisis? What is a crisis to them? What is it externally? What is it internally in terms of what they feel? And she's trying to understand that so we can better build that into our courses and prepare that, uh, help people be prepared for self-management. Then there's organizing the team. So, for example, that anesthesiologist might need to name the things that are happening, help people claim roles, and then aim the team with the intervention. So we have a algorithm, as you've called it before, that's name, claim, aim, that helps people organize mm -hmm. the team. So those are some of the different things that we might do in that interprofessional way. And uh, Jennifer Joris, who's the midwife visiting us from Belgium that you met, is really interested in that sort of interprofessional coordination and collaboration under stress and time pressure. Wow, that example in 90 seconds, let's say, uh, have to logically talk about the protocol, the next step. Um, that's so crazy yeah and while the blood pressure is dropping like what yeah and so these are you know let's get behind the eyes of 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 more uh people you know everything from people that are still um using jerry can gallons to go and get water from wells all the way to um people that are uh working in the restaurants that we're eating and customers at all the way to the nurses and physicians that are working on on our um, loved ones and um, the more that we can do that and, and realize the complexity of what their um, work is and, um, and even potentially you know, do the simulations that get people uh, more comfortable uh, in those environments uh, with more mastery in those environments. Well, and one of the ways we can get them more comfortable is because it's a simulation and the patient is either a mannequin patient or an actor patient who's not going to be harmed or hurt by what's mm -hmm. done or not done is we could literally, and we do, come in in the middle of that situation, we literally press pause. We're like, pause, patient's not gonna get any better, not gonna get any worse. Let's just think this through. What are the signs and symptoms you're concerned about? What are the signs and symptoms you're concerned about? Yes. How are you thinking about moving forward? How are you thinking about moving forward? So they can hear each other's plans, they can calm down a little bit, talk it out, and then we literally rewind a minute or two start it back up so it's sort of like a live video game yes and they can reorganize themselves <laughs> it's so cool when you yeah when you you know when you you know in many ways with well, this is this is a game civilization the human experiment earth is a <laughs> game and so you know it would be fascinating to actually be able to pause our game earth and go how do we you know, geopolitically handle yeah. artificial intelligence. Let's yeah. take a break. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that would be so, so wonderful. If, yeah, uh, stop the world. I want to get off. I need to think about how can we slow down global warming here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because the fact that the economy is just roaring at unprecedented speeds and um, causing us in many ways to not be able to press um, the pause button. It just keeps us going every single day and that's why um, we experience a lot of the miscommunications and issues that we do and we have no space for oops moments um, mm -hmm. with the, yeah, with the um, scale of errors that could potentially be occurring. Yeah. Um, okay. This has been this has been so fascinating, and I want to ask you about um, where you see all of this going with the future of healthcare, um, uh, the future of medical simulations, healthcare simulations. Where do you see this um, moving to in the in the future? So I think there's kind of two or three 
big trends that I think are uh, important and likely to get more important. So one is um, AR, or, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and we're working with a group called eReal, uh, who is uh, synthesizing work from a bunch of universities around Italy to bring AR and VR to healthcare. Uh, and I can talk more about AR and VR. Uh, one is integration of simulation. So we've learned into the healthcare system. And the third is um, using it more for just-in-time type training. So we've already alluded to all three of those. Um, so the AR, VR is an area where uh, there's a number of companies that are already trying to help us visualize, for example, 3D models of things and be actually in them. And we know a lot about the transfer from 3D to 2D that is already showing, for example, in mammography that we can have greater accuracy and better prevention of adverse outcomes with better visualization. This is not my area of expertise, but I believe it's something mm -hmm. that's going to be important. Totally. Uh, the second is this integration. So I'm a simulationista, as they say, but what I'm really keen to do is how do we bring debriefing more and more into just real clinical spaces? We don't need simulation. We have hundreds of cases every day, thousands of cases every day at, at Massachusetts General Hospital or other. Yeah. Could we have a mini micro debrief of that? Are there ways that we, we're not gonna practice on our patients, but there's a lot of what we do that we could learn from if we could have some little moments of reflection. But the other is to build it into the context such that we are testing our systems while building our skills. So we're actually in situ. There's a lot of in situ simulation happening, and I believe that's going to expand in some ways. Institute. In situ. In so situ. right in, in the situation? hospital. Yep, in, in the situ. Si yeah, so using that, uh, what's that Latin word? Yeah, yeah. So in the clinic, in the home, in the real clinic, in the real home, in the in the, uh, in the uh, uh, intensive care unit, in the operating room itself. Oh. So people are using their own equipment, their own oh. environment, their own electronic medical record. Um, and those kinds of things allow us to learn a lot more about the intersection of our skills and our systems. Challenge there is it's very expensive to be in any pr real clinical space. I can potentially take uh, the my own um, electronic health record and uh, and run like my own biometrics and potentially run a simulation on what it would be like if I um, if I took the antibiotic that I needed to combat something or that I need um, if I maybe needed uh, some sort of a, a, a if I would desired a, a genetic engineering procedure of some mm. sort and just see what it would do to me potentially and that that's interesting then of course like uh, um, taking and leveraging the power of, of computation and all the permutations that um, really powerful computing can do um, in the actual operating room and to be able to simulate out if we made this decision in, you know, in just 90 seconds. So here are all the decisions. The highest efficacy is this one. And you know, to be able to see which protocol is best. And then, of course, like you said, debriefings around the world. If I was thinking about it, it'd be great if there were, you know, two teams tackling, and that way the team that tackles the surgery can then go debrief for half an hour while the other team goes and does the next one so that it's not um, having to go from one to the next to the next to the next. There's no debriefing time in between. So that was interesting. And then, of course, yeah, we have some great um, connections for you. We'll love to com um, connect you to Infinite Retina, who we just had on the show on um, uh, uh, spatial computing and augmented reality, uh, and they already um, work with so many um, uh, uh, healthcare organizations that are using the technology to be able to um, uh, have that augmentation, that three-dimensional augmentation of the patient uh, experience to, to make sure it's of uh, greater levels of, of efficacy. Um, awesome conversation in just so mind expanding. I feel so much more enlightened. Um, I want to ask you just two questions that we typically ask our guests on the way out of the show. First question's, of course, funny in the given the context we're in. Uh, are we in a simulation? 
Uh, well, you and I did a little bit of a pre-briefing. We thought a little bit about what we would want to do here. And theoretically, we could pause at any time and rewind, redo. In fact, we should have done that. That would have been kind of fun. Um, I try to approach my life as a little bit of a deliberately developmental opportunity so or action inquiry. And I give myself as much slack as I can to rewind and redo. Uh, so even if we're not going to immediately redo this, um, you know, if this had been a real life, uh, would we be doing this differently or is life a simulation? I like to think about being able to practice and get better. Though, as you say, it's a game with real consequences. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. I will say parts of life are a simulation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the constant uh, leveling up and, um, and knowing that it is uh, building our own, our own skill sets and uh, helping contribute uh, at the level of our family, community, world is just so critical. It brings us most meaning in life and, uh, and that's what I think drives so much of our existence is, is so finding meaning. So uh, I'd like to just ask you a question yes, about yes, simulation. Yes. So I noticed that the podcast is called Simulation. Yes, and yes. I was thinking, wow, Alan must be into rehearsal, practice, something. Why does he call it Simulation? So why is your show called Simulation? It's called Simulation for so many reasons. Um, you know, it's so funny that, you know, we are here, Center for Medical Simulation. And I think that... Um, when you take uh, simulations in healthcare, simulations in engineering software to find the right fit for uh, aerospace or for um, automotive or for whatever industry um, on an engineering software side of things, or there's um, there's simulations used for um, for how to uh, calculate the you know the trajectory of of the rockets that need to go to the International Space Station. You know there's. The, the, the simulations for, for biology, the central dogma of biology, and how that actually works um, when you uh, when you drop in um, you know the, the uh, like pharmaceuticals into the biological system, how that affects it. I mean, it's endless where simulations are actually applied already in in real life, and so you know that's you know one of the reasons. Of course, another one of the reasons is because the the question of if we are in a simulation is very interesting and it also um, speaks greatly to in the next couple of decades um, hopefully within 50 years we'll be running our own um, simulations and we'll be able to do things like look back at um, at how humans actually evolved from you know from the Big Bang um, to the development of the Earth orbiting the star, to the development of, of, of life, uh, all the way up to um, civilization flourishing. And we can actually finally look at all of the artifacts, the archaeology of the anthropology of the evolution, and we can not have to play the guessing game. We can actually watch how uh, language was invented, how fire was invented, how the wheel was invented. Um, and so anyway, that's, you know, these, are the, these are the reasons why So you it's are really attracted to these abilities to kind of predict and, and play out, and that's why you named it simulation? Or? Yeah, yeah, that, and I would also say that um, it's just uh, a lot of the show is about um, also asking really thought-provoking questions to leaders at the edge of their fields and inspiring and engaging other people to get to the edge and work at the edge and build the future. And so... Um, you know, the thought-provoking question, you know, are we in a simulation? Mm. What is consciousness? Mm. Are we alone in the cosmos? The last question we like to ask our guests is, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? Empathy, compassion, attunement, being together, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are, those are really raw, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And... I, I hope that um, one of the things for millennials and for Gen Z is um, really hear what Jenny just said, you know, really the empathy, the attunement, the ability to get behind the other's eyes and to be there with the presence, with the heart and the energy, the spirit right here, you know, <laughs> is uh, so, so crucial. Um, so to say that we're, you know, with our friends when we're FaceTiming yeah. around yeah. the devices is, you know, much, much different. 
So true. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. My this pleasure. has been such been a great, great interview. Yeah, great to meet yes, you. Great yes. to spend some time together. Yes. I love you and I love your work so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing, for all that um, the Center for Medical Simulation is doing. Um, please check out the links below. All Again, the links are harvardmedsim.org. Also, uh, Jenny's link to her LinkedIn profile, the Med Simulation on Twitter, as well as Get Curious Now, um, Jenny's Twitter. Check out those links below, everyone. Let us know your thoughts about the episode as well. So share the thoughts around medical simulation, healthcare simulation with your friends, your families, online, with your coworkers. Let's get more talking about this. Let's get behind the eyes of the physicians and the caretakers, the nurses that are uh, helping us live healthy um, lives and all the complicated um, protocols that they go through. And uh, also support the artists and entrepreneurs and the organizations that you believe in around the world. Simulations links are below as well. Support us, help us scale, help us grow, help us continue coming to cool places like Boston to do interviews like this. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. Peace.